forward. Think Research Channel. When President Bush announced in 2001 his decision allowing federal funds to be used for research on stem cells, he made two other striking comments. Stating his decision was based partly on the fact that stem cells have the ability to regenerate themselves indefinitely, he also said he strongly opposes human cloning. How do we separate the stem cell research debate from the debate over human cloning and genetic screening? What are the pros and cons of these activities? What are the ethical questions surrounding them? I'm Carol Boudreau. Please join me as we explore these issues on Capital Commentary. We're discussing cloning in stem cell research. Is there a viable compromise position in this debate, one that will satisfy both pro-life advocates and pro-biotech research advocates? Joining me in the studio for this discussion are Richard Durflinger, Deputy Director of Pro-Life Activities at the U.S. Conference of Bishops, Kathy Hanna, Consultant on Science and Health Policy, and Jim Olds, Director of the Krasnow Center for Advanced Study here at George Mason University. Thanks. Welcome to the program. Jim, I was wondering if you could explain for us briefly the difference between therapeutic cloning and reproductive cloning. Well, as a scientist, I, th I, I think it's really a matter of intent. Uh, reproductive cloning, uh, to my mind, uh, is cloning with the purpose of producing another human being. Therapeutic cloning, or as I call it, nuclear transplantation, uh, is the notion of uh, uh, creating a, a group of cells which are able to assist uh, dying or very sick tissue to regenerate. So I, I, I think fundamentally it's the purpose of the activity. Would you agree with that, Mr. Durflinger? Um, with part of it. Mm -hmm. uh, the cloning technique in both cases is exactly the same. You can call it nuclear transplantation, many call it somatic cell nuclear transfer. And the product of the technique in every case, if it succeeds, is a human embryo, if it's human genetic material that you started with. Anything that's different is what you do with the embryo afterwards. Well, uh, uh, pardon so me, I, I would say <laughs> that uh, a 200 cell blastocyst, whether it's an embryo or whether uh, that is not an embryo, is a question for both ethical and scientific debate. And um, well, the only people who've succeeded in doing it, the South Korean scientist writing in Science Magazine, which certainly has peer review, said, what we've done is <coughs> clone human embryos. Uh, it's a perfectly neutral term. I don't think we need to debate it. But the, the the matter is that there's no difference in the technique that makes this being. Mm -hmm. The same being that some would like to put in a womb and make a baby is the being that others would like to put in a dish and destroy for its stem cells or do other kinds of research. The meaning of reproductive cloning has actually been shifting in recent years because it used to be defined by its supporters as uh, any effort to put that embryo, that product of cloning, into a womb. Then the scientists found out from three major studies in animals that sometimes to get uh, usable tissues, you actually may have to put the embryo in a womb and grow it to the fetal stage and then abort it for its stem cells. Mm -hmm. So now they're calling that, this kind of fetus farming, they're calling that therapeutic Thera cloning and saying it's only reproductive <coughs> if you're trying to do a live birth. Kathy, I wanted to ask you if you could explain for us the difference between cloning and stem cell research, how they're related, what the differences might be. It's a confusing area. It is confusing, and I think that people tend to conflate um, these technologies. Um, cloning is actually a technique that we've had available for a long period of time. It was only recently that uh, it was taken to a different stage where you actually, to, to explain, and I'll try to be very brief here, um, what you're doing is you're taking the uh, nucleic material, the DNA, out of one cell and putting it into an egg that has been let's just say, cleared out of its own existing DNA. And what you get then is technically what some people would call an embryo. It's a blastocyst and it then begins to grow. Um, that technique is relatively new. 
and that technique, as both of my um, partners here have said, is um, something that can be used to ether produce mm -hmm. a, f a, a child or to grow cell lines. Um, I think the confusion for a lot of people is, is that you can, do, um, s you can do stem cell research without doing cloning. Mm -hmm. um, stem cell research, in fact, most of the work that's going on right now is being done with embryos that are remaining after infertility treatments. Mm -hmm. um, these are embryos that would either be stored in, in perpetuity, depending on the wishes of the, of the uh, donors, or would be destroyed. So most of the research that's being done with, with stem cells right now is being done with remaining embryos left after IVF treatment. Um, there are some efforts to use cloning also to uh, derive s uh, stem cell lines, and there's scientific and medical reasons why you might want to do that mm -hmm. rather than use embryos remaining after infertility. If I could just add one, yes, one point to that, I think uh, Kathy would agree with me. Actually, most of the stem cell research being done now is not being done with embryos at all. And all of the research, all of the stem cell research that is being done now that has helped any human patient didn't use embryos at all. It's from adult tissues, it's from uh, umbilical cord blood. Well, there's and some so serious on. questions, scientific so. questions, about the use of adult, uh, so called adult stem cells. In fact, uh, this last, last week in, in Science Magazine, there, there was an article on uh, really calling into question whether uh, what we call adult stem cells actually produce, uh, produce viable pluripotent cells that, that show up in. in, in other tissues than the bone marrow that they, they came from. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a scientifically debatable point. No, it's, uh, I mean, whether it, whether it stays bone marrow or not, thousands of people have had their lives saved with the help of adult stem cells. That's not debatable. Mm -hmm. there's, there's no question that adult stem cells can be therapeutic, I mean, and that has, has tremendous potential. I think where people differ is that they can't do uh, what most scientists working in this area believe that embryonic stem cells can do. Mm -hmm. meaning that they are much more versatile, they're much mm -hmm. more elastic. Adult stem cells are um, useful and could be potentially useful for certain conditions, but certainly not for all conditions. The other point is the reason why a lot of the work that's being done right now is being done with adult stem cells is because federal funding is not mm -hmm. available to do work with embryonic stem cell lines, so it has forced much of the research into, into this different direction. direction. But this research <laughs> will take place regardless. Mm -hmm. And the question is whether the, the federal government will have the opportunity to regulate this research mm -hmm. or, or whether the research will take place in an unregulated fashion that may, may be ethically inconsistent with the majority of Americans' opinions. So is it fair to say then that the heart of the controversy over stem cell, or stem cell research or cloning has to do with the use of these embryonic cells? And if so, let's, let's talk about that for a minute. Why is it that this particular use of cells has caused so much controversy in the U.S. and, and around the world, for that mm -hmm. matter? Mr. Durflinger? Well, well, many people hold, as I do, that the embryo, the human embryo, uh, is the same being that all of us once was, is a member of the human family, and deserves respect and protection, does not deserve to be treated as a laboratory rat for research. But Others, Kathy's saying that some yeah. people use failed in vitro fertiliza fertilization um, attempts for this research. Is that the same thing as a human being, a failed attempt at in vitro oh, fertilization? It's a successful attempt at in vitro fertilization. It's just that uh, the parents either succeeded in having a baby uh, or gave up in their attempts after you know, failed attempts to, uh, to have a baby using IVF and they had made more embryos than they needed. These embryos are now in freezers. And some of them, actually a small minority, of the total number of embryos are designated for possible use in research. Now, uh, there are all kinds of things that go on in the world in the private sector that the federal government doesn't actively promote by funding it, and this is one of them. The fact that some of these embryos might ultimately end up being discarded by their parents doesn't necessarily mean that we have to force taxpayers who have a moral objection to spend their tax dollars on doing that destruction for research. So that's, a, that's another part that's of the issue. Kathy, what's your view of the ethical concerns that are underlying this debate? It's a uh, very easy question I've just asked you. <laughs> um, I think that, um, first of all, I think most people are opposed to cloning for reproductive purposes for a variety mm -hmm. of reasons. And in this country, we have had the opportunity since 1997 
to pass legislation that would make that illegal. And because of the tying together of these two very different activities, we have not yet outlawed cloning for reproductive purposes. I think, personally, that cloning for reproductive purposes is not necessary. It carries a lot of scientific and medical risks and unknowns, and for that reason alone shouldn't be done, because it places both the future child and the, the mother that would be carrying that child at risk. And for that reason alone, I find it to, unethical to pursue at this point. I do think, though, that people do confuse some of the morality of cloning um, with what I call genetic determinism. I mean, to say that a child who is genetically identical to a parent or to a twin is somewhat lesser or different, uh, I think is a terrible statement to make about the nurture aspect of what we do with our children. I find the same problem with people that reduce uh, a 200 cell uh, blastocyst or mass in a petri dish to equate that with a child who is living and suffering. I've, I have problems with that too. So I think that's the crux of the difference between people who are very much opposed to this research and people who see promise in it. It's what value we place on these cells versus mm -hmm. people mm -hmm. who are alive and Please suffering. Jim. But there's another aspect, I think, which has to do with the millions of Americans that can who are sick who can potentially benefit from uh, uh, stem cell research. What are those benefits? Can you well, explain some for us? Basically, the way we treat diseases now is we, we essentially react to the effects of the disease. So with a disease like Alzheimer's, we have the, the death of nerve cells in the brain, and in, we, we try to figure out ways to react to the death of those cells to ameliorate the effects on higher cognition for, for that person, the loss of memory, the loss of their individuality. Stem cell strategies. <coughs> essentially start to be, first of all, patient-specific, and they're geared at, instead of reacting to the illness, they're, they're geared towards rebuilding, to regenerate. We call it regenerative medicine, to regenerate the, the, the capabilities, the biological capabilities that were there. And millions of Americans suffer from diseases that, that um, stem cells can make a big difference. And I, I happen to know a lot about brain diseases. But there, there are all sorts of people who are in desperate straits for whom regenerative medicine, the hope of, of building back tissue that is either dead or terribly unhealthy and restoring their natural healthy function to them is, is a fantastic promise. Mm -hmm. And I think as much as we, are, we should pay attention to the, 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 a, a child, we also need to, from the ethical perspective, pay attention to people who are adults who are suffering ver very deeply so from disease. So, Richard, yeah, let me let, let you address that, that because, please. Uh, because there, ha there are no live suffering patients who have been helped by embryonic uh, stem cells at this point. And uh, after 25 years of work with these cells in mice, it's hard to find something that you can say was a safe and effective treatment for anything in mice. The, uh, uh, there are a lot of problems in the animal trials with tumor formation. There are a lot of trials, uh, problems with overgrowth. There's but Mr. The Dorflinger, that, that wouldn't you recall that, that um, when the um, recombinant molecular biology technology um, first became prevalent in the middle 1970s, there was a great uproar, ethical uproar over whether we... Yeah, we and I wasn't making that uproar, so it's really irrelevant to what I'm saying. No, but what I'm the, saying uh, is, Mr. What Dorflinger, I'm, what I'm is that there's is a tremendous potential that, in fact, this technology, yes, but we didn't know that about molecular biology Well, we didn't either. know it about fetal tissue. We sure wasted a few million dollars on that to find out it was useless for diabetes, that it made some of the Parkinson's patients worse. So Every once in a while, the scientific community no gets on these fads. Mm -hmm. There have been no benefits yet. There might someday be, but that's speculation. <laughs> what we do know is this. Uh, do we know that? There's clear benefit in animal models. There is, uh, you want to try? Parkinson's, the latest study, 24% of the rats died from the tumors they created. The researchers said in their abstract, this is not a good risk-benefit ratio for trying this in humans. It might someday work, but don't say that it's a proven fact. 
Uh, well, what's no one in science, right Mr. Dorflinger, actually is saying that it's a proven fact because we don't operate that way. We use the scientific method and Good. we conduct experiments. So but I would like to respond to your comment about Parkinson's disease because that is something I professionally know something about. And I have to say that the promise of restoring nerve cells in the substantia nigra pars compacta, the place where the nerve cells die in Parkinson's disease, and restoring the ability of those cells to release dopamine into the caudate nucleus as a fantastic potential sure. that would improve the lives of people who are currently taking drugs which have sure. extremely nasty side effects. And as far but as we can tell, that's been potential. realized already in one human patient, mm -hmm. and they are trying for clinical trials in others. But that trial used uh, adult stem cells. He had almost complete reversal of his symptoms over the course of the last five years. Uh, he just appeared in Congress yesterday at a hearing mm -hmm. to talk about his uh, the success. But what I'm, I'm saying is, the risks the for us. While you're well, I'd like you to answer I want to talk about that. But first, I want to talk about the the, the th that fact that people are saying either you respect the embryo and think it's more important, or you respect the suffering mm -hmm. child. But there are you're saying that's you a know, hundred other ways to treat that suffering child. And uh, so far, we know that the uh, the alternatives are far closer. Some of them already being done in clinical trials. Some of that's them a, a lot scientific closer. That's a scientific judgment. That they're now in clinical trials, the scientific No, no, fact. no, you said And others you. a lot closer because they have to solve the problem with uh, the problems of tumor formation and genetic abnormalities and so on. The problems of directing the embryonic stem cells to a particular kind of cell and then stopping them from turning into mm -hmm. a lot of cells at once. These are all practical obstacles. Someday they may, they may solve them. But right now, what's happening is this. Well, many in the scientific community are on this bandwagon. And as a result, support and attention have dried up for a lot of things that can help and actually already are helping a Such lot of as. people. Such as there are two spinal cord injury patients who appeared at a congressional hearing yesterday. Uh, the first, uh, the second and third actually U.S. patient to be treated by a new spinal cord injury treatment using their own adult stem cells. They had to fly to Portugal to get that because and I think one of the reasons for that is that the Christopher Reeve Paralysis Foundation and a lot of other foundations here have gotten on to the idea that somehow embryonic stem cells is the way to go. And as a result, there's been very limited funding for these trials using adult stem cells. Mr. But Dorflinger, don't you, think it's, <laughs> don't you think there's a possibility that, as with all debates, it's very possible to adopt sort of the lawyer strategy and, and put forward what amounts to a legal brief, only putting forward the, uh, the scientific evidence of one side without acknowledging that, in fact, science, uh, particularly biology, is extraordinarily complex. And to oversimplify uh, the evidence for or against a particular line of research uh, is, is, is fraught with ethical danger. Good. I hope you'll stop doing that then. Kathy, what do you do? You see that there have been possible therapeutic mm -hmm. treatments that have been ignored because of the focus on embryonic stem cell research. No, I don't think so at all. And I think that the federal government funds through NIH funds a great deal of adult stem cell research. I think it's it's a false dichotomy to say we have to choose one or the other. And I don't think any scientist who's working in embryonic stem cell <coughs> research, excuse me, would say that adult stem cell research shouldn't also be pursued in parallel. They are both very promising approaches. The work that's been done in adult stem cell research has by and large so far been one-shot research uh, deals with one publication that have not been replicated. That doesn't mean that they can't be replicated and they don't show great promise. I think everybody would like very much for adult stem cell research to be, uh, have great potential. But the thing is we have to pursue all leads. And I think anyone that's working in the area of Parkinson's disease or diabetes will look at whatever looks the most promising. And I think this kind of notion that scientists are on a bandwagon for some particular uh, type of research is misleading. And I think it's very, it's, it's um, partisan. And I think it's unfair to the scientific community because I think they are pursuing all leads. Any work that's been advancing in adult stem cell research of late has been benefiting from what we are learning from embryonic stem cell research. So the two fields can really help each other. Jim, I wanted to ask you to address Richard's point earlier about taxpayers being forced to fund particular kinds of research that they may find offensive. 
w how would you comment? Well, let's talk a little bit about the National Institutes of Health, which funds the bulk of biomedical, public biomedical research in the United States, approximately $30 billion a year. Now, th the United States biomedical research effort since the Second World War has been really extraordinary. We lead the world in biomedical research. And one of the reasons that I think we've been so successful is because the way we give out money is very different from other countries. We don't give it out like a command economy give it saying, we're going to work in this area and you're going to find a cure for this disease. In fact, the way biomedical research funding works in the United States is through a process that we call peer review, mm -hmm. where scientists who are experts in a particular area sit in reviews and critique each other's grant applications and the best grant applications win through that peer review process that depends both on the expertise of the scientists and the independence of those review sections from the federal government. All right? Now. It's enough of a guarantee, Richard? That the oh, no, that, I mean, uh, nobody thinks that's enough of a guarantee. The NIH has mm -hmm. all kinds of ethical and policy restrictions, especially when human subjects are involved that uh, tell the scientists, well, even if you think this is really promising, it's not something we're going to pursue. And since 1996, All scientists, Mr. Congress Gerflinger, has buy said that into review of human subject research, and you know that. But what I think we're talking about is Congress how has said you can't use the funds to destroy human embryos. What we're talking about is how federal funds are given out in biomedical research. Within those limits. I think the important point here about whether taxpayers should pay for something that they find morally mm -hmm. uh, offensive um, is why we have a representative democracy. I mean, people can vote for their members of Congress, um, and they can vote if they want to vote on that issue. That's the way we express our point of view. Um, I think it's interesting that in the Congress, both in the House and the Senate, as members of Congress have become more educated about what this field is all about, there is a very slow, and I think it's a smart, incremental change of opinion. People will vote, you know, people can vote. That's how we, that's how we make decisions in this country. Um, but I do think that as people are learning more about what the various aspects of these different approaches are and what the potential is, I think people are changing their minds. I wanted to go back to a question that was raised a little bit earlier. Kathy raised it concerning the ban on human cloning. We don't currently have a, a legal ban on human cloning. Should we have one, Jim? We definitely should have one. Mm -hmm. In fact, I think I reflect the consensus of most of my colleagues in science that um, reproductive cloning, for the, that is cloning for the purpose of producing another human being, is wrong. And there is no reason to pursue that, that, that line. Therapeutic cloning or nuclear transplantation is focused exclusively on, on following a line of research that may help millions of American citizens in terrible straits. And the other side, unfortunately, Mr. Dorflinger, is, I believe, confusing the issue and implying that scientists are, in fact, for reproductive cloning. And I'm here to tell tell our audience, that's simply not the case. Well, whenever they come out in favor of what used to be called reproductive cloning, they just change the definition so that reproductive cloning becomes the slogan Mr. Dorflinger, for what we're I'm not going to pursue the, right I'm against now. using the technology to produce another human being, and I believe... At what um, stage? Uh, uh, I, uh, for the purposes of producing a human baby, I'm against that, and most okay. of my colleagues in See, science it are. it used to mean you were against putting it in a womb, and now it means you're against bringing it to live birth. There is a bill in Congress that would ban only what Jim calls reproductive cloning, but it doesn't ban the cloning procedure at all. What it bans is uh, trying to put that embryo in a womb. In other words, what it tries to do, and this is a pretty difficult task in a country with uh, the uh, constitutional principles we have on pregnancy and abortion, is to make it illegal for a woman to put one of those embryos in her own womb. Uh, there are constitutional problems with that. There are great moral problems with that because aside from, you know, now we're going beyond saying, well, it, you know, maybe you can let scientists kill some embryos that's going to help somebody. You now have the government mandating, uh, saying you can create these embryos, but then as a government mandate, you must Mr. destroy Dorfinger, them. Mr. Dorfinger, wouldn't those you embryos be destroyed anyway? You cannot let them live anyway? or that's a crime. No, because they wouldn't have been made in I've, the first place. IVF this is 
Wait a minute. This is cloning we're talking about, the cloning bill. Uh, wouldn't IVF embryos that could be used in therapeutic cloning be destroyed anyway? There is no government mandate I just am in any, interested. Is that any the answer? state in the nation that says it's a crime not to destroy your embryo. And that for the first time in human history that I can think of, we would ha that's what we would have with a federal cloning ban that operates by saying you can use them for research, but it's illegal to let them survive beyond that in a womb. Uh, there are some states that have banned uh, cloning. Uh, most of the ones that have acted that are in effect now are bans on the cloning procedure across the board to make human embryos for either of these purposes. And that, in fact, is, the, uh, is where the momentum is in the international scene. Uh, Canada has passed a complete ban on cloning of the kind I'm talking about that I support. Australia has passed it. Germany has had one for many years. Uh, France is just in the process of finalizing their complete ban on cloning. So Kathy, the, in the international scene, there's... No, I think... International scene looks like what? The Canadian ban is for reproductive purposes. Oh, and, no. And I think that, you know... It's, there, it's There is tremendous amount of research going on in Europe and in some of the Asian countries using embryonic uh, stem cells and using cloning for embryonic stem cell purposes. Now, it's important to distinguish between the IVF embryos mm -hmm. and the embryos that would be created through a cloning process for the purpose of, st of stem cells. And the reason you would do that is because you would want to overcome some clinical and scientific problems that might arise if you were deriving a cell line from an embryo that was discarded after infertility treatments. For example, you wanted to create um, a cell line from an individual who had some kind of autoimmune disease, let's mm -hmm. say, and could not tolerate having cell lines injected from another genetic or another mm -hmm. genome, and they would need their own cell lines engineered and then re-injected into them. So you're only involving one, one That's person. That's actually the very kind of disease that uh, Ian Wilmot, the cloning expert who produced Dolly the Sheep, recently said in British Medical Journal that cloning is absolutely useless for. Because in an autoimmune disease, the patient is attacking his own cells as though they were foreign. And so if you make stem cell line from a cloned embryo, they're genetically identical to the patient, and they'll be attacked in exactly the same way as his own cells already were. As a result, you know, Dr. You Wilmot I fear said, that immunology is more complex it's than It's much you're, more complex, well, and, and you're you're putting can, forward and you argue can with, argue with Dr. Wilmot about you it. You can re-engineer But he says, the therefore, cells. these are, you know, cloned, cloning is unnecessary mm -hmm. and probably useless for autoimmune diseases like juvenile diabetes. Sounds uh, like a so sound bite to me, Mr. Dorflinger. Mm -hmm. It's a true one. I'm an, it's unfortunate, but I have to say it, that it's just about time for us to close up our discussion today. This has been a wonderful discussion, and we certainly have a lot to learn about this subject. I'd like to thank our panelists for joining us today to discuss cloning and stem cell research, and I'd like to thank you, our viewers, for taking time to join us. If you have comments or questions about today's show, please email us. I'm Carol Boudreau for Capital Commentary.